Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Assalatu wassalamu ambiya muslim. Allah salli ala Muhammad. Alhamdulillah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh everyone. May peace be upon you wherever you are. Alhamdulillah. Uh, tonight in Singapore, uh, maybe evening or daytime, uh, everywhere else uh, you are watching this live on the Muslims uh, Art and Film Festival. This is our last segment and uh, we have a wonderful and uh, uh, interesting <laughs> someone who I admire the most in doing design, photography and publication. Sidi uh, Sohil Nakhoda. And the title for tonight, uh, which is interesting, Bridging a Fracture World Through the Lens of Journalism. Uh, can we uh, invite Sidi uh, Sohil to join us now? Yeah. Masha'Allah. Assalamualaikum Sidi. Walaikum salam. Uh, How are thank you? Thank you very Masha much, Sidi Khaled. I'm very well, very well. Um, it's a pleasure to you know to see you finally after so many years. That I think the last time I was in Singapore was uh, what four or five years? Yeah, five years uh, ago. Yeah, you know, and, uh, nice I'm really, uh, I'm really little... happy to be you know part of this program and thank you for inviting me. And so, and, uh, and, uh, thank you, for... you know, a, a good evening and a good afternoon, a good morning for every <laughs> participant that's uh listening to this. I hope that yeah. will not bore everyone to death. But <laughs> well, uh, uh, we, we are actually blessed and honored to have you on board uh, with your vast experience in many fields, actually. We, we, we want to learn from you, Sidi. So, uh, Sidi, before we proceed with the interview, uh, I, I, I believe we have a video that you like to share with us. Uh, can you tell us more about the video? Yes, well, I, I prepared this, uh, you know, for, for this event. So, you know, because we were talking about photography and publishing and design yeah. uh, and photography is something I do. Uh, I'm a serious amateur. I wouldn't call myself a professional, but, but I take it very seriously. And uh, so this is a collage of my, some samples of my photos that will give a range of what I do okay. um, and my style of photographing and, you know, over the decades. So some of it is from Libya. Uh, from the UK, from the US, from the Emirates, from some from Malaysia, and you know different uh, parts of the world. So I hope it gives you some glimpse of, uh, you know, of some of the stuff that I, that I will be sharing with you that, uh, in this conversation. Uh, and this, uh, I just want to thank the the team here in Amman at Libya's channel because their team of uh, expert uh, videographers helped me put this together. So I wanted to acknowledge that, uh, and, and I'm grateful for them. Inshallah. Yeah. I think, shall we uh, play the, the video now? There should be sound also. Yeah. No, I think... Thank you. 
Mashallah, beautiful city. Uh, okay. All the photos are very sharp and really capture my my attention. Mashallah, may Allah preserve you. You all these. I always look up to your posting on the photography in your Facebook. Mashallah, and I really enjoyed it. Subhanallah. Uh, thank you once again for joining our city. And uh, for those who are watching us, uh, just like to say a few things before we start the interview. Uh, that is, uh, Shidi Sohail used to be the editor of Islamica, and that's how I got to know about him. His name first, Sohail Nahoda, and I was really mesmerized by the magazine. Actually, I bought I bought all the, the issues, and um, really keep it very nicely. Uh, it's, it's well done. Uh, Sidi, my first question to you in regards to your work that you did you did before, like uh, Islamica, for example. Uh, when you first started Islamica magazine, the vision was to broaden perspectives on, on Islam and provide a forum for Muslims to articulate their concern while establishing cross-cultural relations between Muslims and their neighbors and co-religionists. Why was this such an important objective for this magazine? Sure, thank you. Thank you for that question. Well, uh, you know, I, I arrived in the UK in the, um, the mid-80s. Uh, and prior to that, I had already lived in several countries. I was born in Mozambique, and then my family moved to Hong Kong, and then to Portugal, where I was for a long time, and then to Ireland, and to Spain, and briefly for the UK, and then Pakistan. And it was, you know, from Pakistan that I ended up, uh, you know, with the family uh, uh, coming to the UK and staying an extended period. Uh, and it was at that time that I went to school in the UK for the first time and, um, you know, and then u university and so on. But England or the UK in the, in the, in the 80s was, uh, you know, a very difficult place. I think out of all the countries I've, I, I lived and visited, uh, I found, you know, the, the UK scene as it were, perhaps the most difficult to, uh, uh, to tackle. Uh, and clearly when, you, when I joined, when I went to the, to the university, to the London School of Economics in, in 1989, uh, to do my you know, undergraduate degree, 
what was happening there was, uh, was similar to what was happening in most campuses throughout the United Kingdom. And that is a, a, a deep fracture in, in, the, in the campuses amongst Muslim students. It was a, there was extremism, you know, we had, this was a period of time when we had not just radical Salafism, but we had Hizb al-Tahrir, which was an, an absolute nuisance, uh, and its offshoot, the Muhajirun. And the ideas of the Islamic State and the Khilafah and, and so on, and on the other hand, amongst the radical Salafis, you had this kind of, you know, uh, uh, aggressive, you know, kind of posture to, uh, to demolish all the schools of law, of theology, of Sufism, and so on. Uh, and so the young Muslim, you know, particularly even those which were in fairly intelligent, were caught in this kind of, you know, competing visions of what Islam was, where, where, when none of them, you know, neither of them, uh, were actually, um, you know, authentic versions of our, of our religion. And even, you know, if students came from fairly progressive backgrounds or from educated backgrounds, you know, up and down the country, the Islam, however, that they met was either of these two versions. Mm -hmm. And both of them were not progressive. You know, they were both retarded, in my opinion. And I'm sorry, but in this interview, I'm, I might be blunt uh, about <laughs> okay. many things. And I don't okay. necessarily like to, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, not to be blunt on issues. So that's the way I, I usually discuss things. Uh, so I hope no one's going to sue me for this, but, you know, if, <laughs> no, if, if no, there are not. questions, they can always engage with me. But this mm -hmm. was a very difficult time. You know, uh, the Muslim groups that were there, in particular their ideologues, were not giving the young Muslim community any direction whatsoever. Neither were, they, were the Muslim young people growing uh, in learning, uh, in a way that was that was productive for their lives, both as as human beings, as citizens, as family members, and and you know, and so on. But at the same time, it, it was killing their spirit, you know, from within, you know, through this kind of dark vision of what Islam is, this polarized, you know, uh, you know, kind of Manichaean conception of of, of sin and salvation, and, and uh, you know, and and the world and the hereafter, you know, and so on. It was almost as if you know they had given up, you know, living in this universe. And, and, and either it was all about <laughs> total control, you know, of dominating, uh, of, a, of, a, of a theology that was into politics, into mm -hmm. you know militarism, into extremism, but one that wanted to control, you know, uh, the state as a way of controlling the public, or it was simply a, an absurd kind of a you know regression into solitude where. You know the the, the the nature of how they viewed religion was simply so reduced that it was impossible for them to you know to engage with anyone else. You know every everything was a sin. You know it, it was darkness everywhere. They had difficulties adjusting to you know to to their own families. So you and and this came inside the university. So when a young Muslim joined the university, even if they were the top one percent of the of, of of their communities, it didn't matter. You know it was the same. Uh, uh, you know, problem uh, that they were all experiencing. And it was impossible, you know, to do anything constructive. So when I joined the university, I, I noticed these things too. But, um, but we decided at the university not to, to replicate the same models and perhaps try something completely different. And that is that the Islamic society, the nucleus where Muslim students would gather and congregate around the country, should not be uh, this uh, mini, you know, khilafat within the campus. Uh, you know, that kind of notion, you know, had to go. Rather, in my opinion, what I wanted at the LSE was to create a community, a learning community, a support community, a community that is active, but in the best of ways. And so the idea was not that you, you know, you would, you would gender segregate and you would bring the khilafah inside the university or anything like this, rather, bring a community of Muslims together, whether they were secular or super pious or beards or no beards, hijab or no hijab, whether they were from Pakistan or England or from America, it really didn't matter whether they were Muslim or non-Muslim. But the fact that they were coming together and, and providing each other support, uh, learning together, you know, and perhaps discussing things, uh, pushing their own you know, levels of knowledge of what they knew was to me the most important thing that that, uh, that eventually led to Islamica. Why? Uh, because, you know, they came from backgrounds where their own understanding of Islam was, uh, was, was very fragmented, but also very reduced. We have a great civilization and we have, you know, at least in Sunni Islam, I, 
cannot speak much for the Shia Islam because I'm not an expert. But at least in my tradition, you know, we had the two schools of Aqidah, you know, the Asharis and Maduridis. We had the four schools of Islamic law, the Hanafi, Hanbali, uh, Shafi, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, did I forget some? I forget, I think I forgot the fourth one. Mm. Um, and uh, I said Shafi, Hanbali, uh, Maliki, and, and Hanafi. And, and we had also the, the hundreds of, of Sufi tariqas that gave expression to spirituality. So we have within our ethos a very wide, uh, civilizing, you know, plural, diverse uh, set of intellectual, you know, platforms, you know, that, that both deal with the heart, with the brain, and with, the, with, with our movements in society. And it was important to make sure that Muslim, young Muslims understood that heritage. Rather than reducing the vision to just uh, a, a, a series of issues about sin and salvation or the Islamic State, it was important that they understood who they are first. You know, what are they sitting on? What is their patrimony? What is their heritage? Uh, and rather than brag about the fact that, you know, we had a Biruni or al Ghazali or even Sina and so on, well, how about, you know, what about the next generation of Birunis and Ghazalis and even Sinas and Dunis and so on? You know, how is that going to come, you know, come in the future? Uh, so to give them some grounding uh, and, and some humility in their religion was critical. We wanted to form a learning uh, uh, community where we, we would invite speakers, you know, poets, um, theologians from all sides. We had some amazing people coming in, talking about the latest books or ideas or, or uh, you know, Karen Armstrong, we had, uh, you know, uh, Imran Khan, we, we, had, we had a lot of people from politicians to, to, uh, uh, to artists to theologians. And the idea was to create a, a safe space for discussion, a discursive space, as it were, where people could explore their religion, uh, learn, uh, because I mean, when you are 18 and 19, how much Islamic state knowledge can you know? Mm -hmm. Not much, you know? So I think that people, everyone needed to calm down a notch or two. And it was important to create a sustainable environment where learning was important. And you know, I noticed one thing which I always found very, very bizarre, particularly in the UK, when a young Muslim would join Islamic society, and within its Islamic society, you know, walls, mm -hmm. as it were, they would be, they would pretend that this was the, the, the Khalifa, you know, it was the Khilafa. But as soon as they would leave the meeting, they would be, you know, joining their courses in, in, in economics, in logic, or in science, or whatever. And why is it that the same kind of, uh, you know, rationality, or let's say the same intelligence, was not shown when it came to religion, but it was shown when it came to their secular sciences? Mm -hmm. You know, I never understood that kind of dichotomy in their brains, where you would be super smart, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, in, your, in, your, in your life, uh, you know, in the university, but when it came to religion, you'd be super retarded, you know, and, and, and that had to, in a way, you know, it wasn't uh, something that was wholesome for us or for anyone else. And Islamica came out of that experience. We wanted to both learn about our heritage. We also wanted to contribute as thinking people, uh, you know, people who be doing critical thinking to push our religion forward. That is not, not redefine our tenets of faith and so on, but simply move the discussions forward so we could Grow with confidence. Okay, half of the problem is that when you just view religion as law and religion as politics, is that something is missing, and that is a love for your religion. That you know, of mercy or compassion and those kind of values, you know, which are absolutely essential. So Islamica was a transformation from a physical, you know, in, in environment of Islamic society into publishing. But the same values were translated into that, and we also noticed as we invited people in, to our seminars and workshops, which we did, you know, I think sometimes we'd have within an academic year almost 100 speakers you know, from around the world. Uh, it became clear to us that many people who were outside, you know, the LSE or in Glasgow or Harvard or Oxford or, or in, in Malaysia or elsewhere were following what we were doing and wanted to be part of this particular effort. So the magazine was a way uh, to extend the discussion beyond the confines of our own university and to somehow create a network of like-minded people uh, that would be discussing learning together. So you remember the twin things of one is that we have to learn and we, we have to stop this, this idea that uh, at age 18 and 19, we have the answers of 
the whole universe and destiny and so on. And at the same time, as thinking people, as intelligent people, begin to, under, to see how is it that we can contribute to the, to the building of or rebuilding of Islamic civilization in all fields from economics to politics, to science, to Sufism, to poetry, to literature, whatever it was, you know, uh, to make again a religion aspect of it uh, uh, relevant, you know, to people's concerns. And so that was in a way how Islam came about to solve the issue of the fractured nature of the communities that were in the UK at the time. MashaAllah, so profound and so in-depth, uh, Sidi. Uh, but Sidi, uh, journalism and publishing bridges scholars, like you mentioned, there's now all walks of life, uh, different fields contributing, right? Like thinkers, writers, activists, musicians, poets, and people uh, who are in, in their own field or specialists in certain field provide better re representation and highlight perspective which might have been downplayed. How important uh, do you think it is today uh, to bridge people together uh, through publishing and the written word? I think that, uh, you know, it's absolutely important. I think every age uh, has its own needs. And I think that the need of our times is to make ourselves understood and to also communicate, you know, who we are and, and what we believe. Uh, and our values and also our views. And I think that the communication is, is, is key for the transmission of anything from feelings to, you know, to, to whatever it is that you have in mind you want to share with someone else, it requires communication, whether it is to one person uh, or if it is to a million, it's the same, it's the same system, you know, as it were, the same process. But what we are terrible at doing is to figure out how to communicate to the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that in yeah. this, we need to understand what idiom is it that the world that we need to use to communicate what we believe and what we want to share to the world in the best way possible. And that's where we find the issue of not communication. We almost, we talk a lot, you know, our families talk a lot. We have a lot of ventures, but why is it that the impact is not felt? What's going wrong? Are we talking over people? Are we talking about issues which don't matter to them? Are we talking the language that they don't understand? Uh, what is it, you know, and I think that that's the failure. I think that part of the problem is that we've, we've failed to mainstream our efforts. You know, whenever you want to be a Muslim, you know, the discussion is always, and it's, it's tiring that discussion, oh, I'm a Muslim, I should do something Islamic, otherwise I'm not authentic. Well, that, I think that's topical for me, you know. You're a Muslim and you contribute first in your own field of endeavor and you become the best at it. So if it's journalism that you wish to go to, go for it. So many people that I know who had a great skill in writing, a great skill in communicating, that were master wordsmiths, didn't go into journalism because either their parents, you know, decided it wasn't good for them or because of peer pressure. The peer pressure was actually the worst because what happened in this peer pressure group? Oh, don't join the newspaper or the magazine because it's all dominated by anti-Muslim voices. You know, you'll never get yourself published. You know, you'll never, they'll never give you a chance. Everything they write is always anti-Muslim. I, I think that that kind of nonsense, you know, uh, really, um, uh, I think affected our community's ability to enter domains of communication that were vital for the creation of attitudes. And I don't mean here that, you know, we were, it's not a, an intelligence kind of, you know, uh, uh, effort where, we were programming people to join this group. No, no, not at all. But it's important to, to be a writer. It's important to write that novel, you know, that everyone reads. Uh, it's important to, uh, you know, to write that article that everyone reads. It's important in a way to write that, um, to produce that film that everyone watches. It's, it's important to produce that music that everyone will come and listen to, you know? All of it is form of communication, from poetry to painting to, to filmmaking to acting, all of it, you know, from photography, all of it are, are mediums of communicating from feelings which are from uh, which are difficult to express, are intangible, and to tangible feelings which are more material. And I think that this is where we fail. The, the, the whole industry of journalism, you know, needs a lot more Muslims taking part without fear. And again, without making it all about Islam, they should be writing about everything from football to music to critique, you know, on art 
to architecture to make their few views felt about the world, about international relations, diplomacy, human trafficking, whatever it is. I mean, why is it that in the UK you have the Turner Prize, which is an, an art prize that's issued every year? What is the Muslim writing about, you know, the Turner Prize? Why is it that the Muslim has to be typecast into believing that he or she can only write about Muslim issues? And I think so long as that keeps happening, none of the writers ever make a name for themselves or transcend their niche. And I think that whilst, yes, niche is good, that, you know, yes, the Muslims, so we write about Muslims things, that's okay, you know, that's fine. But it, what it does, it restricts your, your range of vision or, or your field of vision. You should be writing for the whole world. Why just for Muslims, you know? Uh, why is, is your particularity so niche that only five people listen to you, you know? And I think that th that's where. So work with the best. My advice has always been, if, you, if, if you're great at journalism, well, then you're gonna have to struggle, join a, a newspaper, start as an intern, even if you have to make coffee, learn mm -hmm. from the masters which are in that particular industry, how to write, how to edit, how to chase stories, uh, and go and get that Pulitzer Prize, you know? Mm -hmm. Make a name in your, in your name. I think we have to simply stop thinking that, well, our only success as Muslims is within, you know, ventures which are so niche and an island onto themselves that they have no impact. You know, and then we look at, at, the, at, the, at the broad range of 10 or 15, 20 years, and we find out that we've had very little impact, even though we've had many Muslims doing many things, because we simply were not effective in our modes of, or idioms of communication. And even if right now you are, uh, sorry to go on, but even if you are, you know, are very progressive, if you believe in, in uh, you know, kind of post-colonial literature, or you are a woke, you know, individual, whatever it is, you still have to know your Shakespeare. You still have to know, you know, your John Donne. Or, or what I'm saying is that wherever it is that you're situated in whatever, uh, you know, region or, or geographic location you are based, you have to know that particular culture well. And to be able to talk to, to them in a language and in a mode that makes sense to them. And so I would now still encourage, I would definitely encourage young people to go into that field even if that whole industry has become, um, uh, you know, is suffering, let's just say suffering, you know, financially because you know print journalism is a, uh, you know, is a declining, uh, you know, uh, industry at the moment. Yeah. But uh, it's a struggle worth making. It's like a meltdown. You call it now everywhere people. But see, I just want to be digress a bit. You know, I have known some people uh, who love journalism, who love to write. And they, they they really like right, but they are not like those people who you mentioned where they can articulate well sentences and that sort of top notch journalism. And you also mentioned about learning from someone and uh, learning how to get the news, learning how to uh, be creative. So such people are they able to to be part or to be in the field of journalism if. If someone were to say your English is not that, or your writing, I mean, like not that standard to be uh, genuine. Because I've met some people who have interest, who have passion in it. Yeah, I, I think you know, in my in my in my career as a publisher, part of the thing I loved the most was to find talent. I, it's you know, mentoring talent or creative young talent is, is perhaps the most satisfying thing out there. And even in Islamica, many young writers came uh, and they were all over the place, you know, when they were writing, they had talent, they had raw talent, and they had uh, a way with words, but they simply didn't know how to put a, an article together or how to write in a way that would be, would make their, uh, would it be effectively read or communicated to someone else. And so it took a while, it took, it took a lot of training. They themselves had to train. They had to, uh, you know, take additional classes. Um, they had to push themselves. Uh, some of their work was rejected and they had to be open to critique. And that's the other problem. You know, you're not going to make it in anything, whether it is design or publishing or photography or whatever, if you are not open to criticism uh, and you do something with it. And I think that I've seen many people that, uh, you know, had an amazing talent, you know, an amazing way of expressing themselves, even if they, if they didn't know how to write, but they had something in them that uh, made expression possible you know, or easy. Uh, and they were able to express difficult things in a very simple way and in a very effective way. But it took a bit of time to develop their craft or to hone their, you know, their, their rough edges 
uh, and uh, to make sure that they were they became effective writers. And then they went on to do great things. They, they joined the Guardian. They joined, you know, uh, other standard publishing, you know, uh, ventures which were far bigger than ours. And so you don't want to stop a talent. You want them to develop as much as possible and and, and you know have impact in in in, in this career. Uh, but if you find someone who has that skill, push them ahead. You know? Yeah, mashallah, indeed. I think in particular our community, I uh, felt that uh, if you are not good enough, then you shouldn't proceed. So I think that's one of the things that a lot of a lot of young people, uh, Muslim, I'm referring to that, they sort of uh, half-hearted whenever they hear this, you know. I mean, I wish everyone is like you, where <laughs> we are given the chance to grow and, you know, to improve ourselves. Uh, I think that, you know part of it is also the the, the the problem of our communities. I think that we our own you know greats have not paid sufficient effort or time to mentoring and to and to creating a new generation of people that could that could take over you know that particular field, whether it is in photography or design or writing or or, or, or filmmaking or whatever. I think that they we have to think you know very carefully to make sure that we are uh, you know picking new talent you know that perhaps can 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 not only become a great name themselves in the field, but also can push the whole discussion or the whole, you know, effort of, of uh, Muslim contribution, you know, much more than we have been able to, to do. Uh, and I think that it, it requires community support. It also requires support from the greats of that industry, you know. Uh, I think they themselves have to realize that, you know, it's, uh, it's about time that they also share their talent, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and took people I, by the hand in, when it came to teaching and learning and transferring knowledge. I think that there is no other way, whether you're mentoring business entrepreneurship or whether you're mentoring, you know, uh, in photography, whatever it is, you know, even some, uh, teaching someone how to write or produce a CV uh, or apply for a grant, all of it requires, you know, mentoring. And I think yep. that we have to pay attention to that. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's actually vital. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, Sidi, um, uh, relating to that, what you had said, right? Among the hallmarks of good journalism is the ability to ask. Uh, the question which offer a unique, urgent and important perspective on the story at hand. Based on your experience, right, Sidi, what are some of the bigger questions that all of us need to begin asking ourselves in order to have a deeper understanding of ourselves and what's happening around the world yeah. yeah i think that you know part of doing critical thinking and and, and philosophy and theology and kalam and, and sufism and everything else is that you broaden your mind the range of questions that you ask yourself and others uh, are, are that much more complex uh, and i think that it's that kind of complexity that we have to bring we we encourage our own children to ask 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 and mm -hmm. even you know they ask the toughest questions you know children mm -hmm. and we know yeah. that but yeah. that spirit of asking questions is something that should never, ever be curtailed. Throughout their lives, they should be asking questions, you know? They should be asking questions even to their bosses, you know, to, to their peers. They should be asking questions to their sheikhs, to yeah. everyone else, you know, until they die. Because the process of learning never will never cease. Uh, but the good question is what triggers, you know, uh, new development. And people have to learn how to ask questions. And they have to ask questions from several vantage points. You know, because then that's when you get the creative kind of, you know, you know nexus of, of, uh, uh, of energy, you know, that does, you know, develop things forward. And when we uh, repress questions or when we don't have a space where those questions can be safely asked, I think that's the, the greatest disservice that we can do to the human mind. The human mind has questions. It, it generates questions. Uh, it's deeply critical. And I think that we have to, we have to, in a way, respect that those very critical modes of which are in our brain, and even those which are in our heart, and to be able to express them without fear, or, or, or where in environments that they'll be taken seriously, okay? Even if they, you know, if they're wrong, it doesn't matter. The main thing is that you're asking, your brain is fertile, uh, and you're learning. And so, but what kind of questions are people asking now? All kinds of stuff, you know? What is a community? What is individualism? What is freedom? What is responsibility? We've had a lot of freedom, but you, know, you see young people today, very few know about their responsibilities to their families, to their communities, to the world. 
uh, you know, issue of citizenship. You know, when, when you are talking about the Islamic State, however, the rest of the world has a concept called a citizen, you know? So what happens to those notions? You know, you can't build an Islamic State without having a, a very deep and, and developed conception of what a citizen is. If you don't have that conception, don't build this Islamic State, you know? Uh, because it could become a repressive Leviathan. Now, God in the universe, religion and science has become a key, key discussion in this, in this age. Uh, revolution and stability. Over the last 10 years, you know, questions of revolution, you know, uh, were they good or bad? Can society change any other way? Is stability more important than a convulsion, in, in, you know, where you have displacement, refugees and destruction? Or, or how? And how do you create freedom and space to think and to live with dignity? Uh, we have cosmopolitan identities. So much needs to be kind of explored because it's not like before. Now, a young kid is listening to the same music, you know, in, in one yeah. part of the universe, you know, of, of this, of our planet and, and, and the other. <laughs> so all of these questions are, are, are key, but there's something fundamental also, particularly in religion, that is, as people move away, or as many, you know, in Western, you know, at least in modern societies, move away from organized religion, it's not as if that they're all becoming atheists, you know? Yes, many of them are becoming agnostic because they simply cannot find the answers from their own religious communities or from the structures which are, you know, representing those communities or from the teachers which seem to convey, you know, the, the, uh, what that religion is all about. However, they are gravitating to spirituality. They, they, they have a need for a spiritual kind of existence. And so those questions of spirituality, of religion, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of agnosticism are all things which are being discussed right now. And I think that it, it, it's a space where a lot of humility is required and a lot of deep thinking and listening is going to have to be done. Rather than simply you know, coming into the discussion uh, from a vantage point of knowing everything, I think we really have to, to, to kind of listen to these issues and find ways of, of bringing spirituality back into people's, people's lives that can give them meaning and perhaps more authenticity. Inshallah. Interesting and beautiful, Sidi, your answer. Uh, in your working experience, right, Sidi, as a publisher and uh, editor, um, you have covered many pertinent issues that affect the Muslim world and humanity at large. Just now we're talking about how we give space to young people and the question and so on. Uh, many would look at this issue and seeing it, uh, a crumbling world at the brink of no return and lose hope. Right? With social media, everything comes right in your face. In your experience, how can one have keen awareness of the issue, yet use it to become a means of positive change uh, in society. Okay, you know, even the first Christians, you know, in, in the, uh, the early Christian church, uh, were, uh, always felt that the, the apocalypse or Armageddon was very near. Mm -hmm. When Baghdad was ransacked by the Mongols, I'm yep. sure that the, uh, you know, uh, the citizen or the resident of Baghdad thought that that was the end of the world. When Attila the Han ran across from Mongolia all the way, you know, to Europe, mm -hmm. many people who were killed, you know, probably their families thought that that was the end. Uh, history is relative. There, if, if you say that, well, this is the worst age ever in terms of war, well, you know, what about the two world wars? You know, that they, mm -hmm. that was even more catastrophic than what we yeah. have now. Yeah. It's always relative. There will always be conflict and there will always be conflict everywhere. Uh, you know, we've never had, you know, entire centuries and centuries and centuries of, of, of peace uh, because human beings are what they are. However, and it doesn't mean, you know, because I think too much uh, apocalyptical kind of, you know, Armageddon type of thinking uh, can also lead to a loss of hope. Okay. And when you have loss of hope, you, you stop almost being productive, you know, in a, in, in, in a good sense, because otherwise, the, when you have despair, all that emanates out of that is dark, you know, <laughs> is darkness no. of negative energy. And I think negative energy, in a way, exacerbates the problem even more. I see a lot of young people, you know, our own Muslims, completely demoralized and depressed, you know, uh, 
but their minds are full of 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 of, uh, of end of times, you know, prophecies which they which they try to interpret, uh, which they shouldn't interpret, but they try to, and and full of conspiracy ideas, you know, which are easily found on the internet. And I think that what that does is that it really it really robs them of hope uh, and and kind of you know ability to see through and how to to work through solutions, you know, that perhaps that can be very readily done uh, on all matters. Some, of course, are more difficult than others, but, but there is always something positive that one can do. Uh, and I, so in, in that way, I, I think that it's important to fight that because, yes, we have a lot of issues right now facing, but it should not lead to depression you mm -hmm. know, and, and to trauma. And, and I think that we have to figure out a way uh, to be able to experience beauty. You know, I mean, colors, you know, the world is very colorful, you know. Uh, you find goodness everywhere. You find, you know, self-sacrifice everywhere. You find beauty everywhere, even in the most remarkably remote of places. You know, so feel the air. You know, uh, uh, feel the bees. You know, and 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 then look at the colors of the, you know, that are in front of you, and quit this kind of, you know, this demoralizing, you know, uh, 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 kind of perspective of life. Which then affects every single speech and chutbah and sermon that they give. It affects every single perspective that they, you know, advice they give to everyone else. And I think that that is is doing us a huge harm. Yes, there are problems which are of a very serious nature, but they require some serious thinking and development. You know, but you have to always be optimistic and, and hopeful. If you lose that, then there's no way that we can solve anything. You know, or, or work our way through difficult. Uh, circumstances. So I think that, you know, for me, that's important because without that ingredient, we always, you know, I, I, I mean, every week I see Islamic scholars, you know, uh, preaching doom and gloom and, and, and the world is ending tomorrow and it never does. And, and then, you know, what it does is it simply retards the brain into being unable to do something constructive, you know, uh, for their own communities or for everyone else. Uh, and I think that that's a really, really big danger that we have to be very, very careful of. Uh, Siri, but I think, uh, i just like to see your perspective on this. Do you think that, uh, I mean, everyone being blaming like social media is at fault because it changes the landscape of our life. You know, it used to be, nobody knows anything goes on until months or weeks later on. But now like even story may be manipulated or fake news and so on. So how do we find that balance in today's society, you know, where people are easily triggered just because they saw something, you know, unexpectedly happen. And uh, as, uh, as a journalist, as an editor, how, how, how do you, what do you advise for all these things? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's difficult, you know, in, in, I mean, the problem now in, in, in journalism is that you have so much fake news that, that's mm. generated yeah. uh, because of the web, because of social media. It's, it's very difficult to, to, to be able to adjudicate if an event sometimes happened this way or that way, or whether it happened in the first place, you know, because of the fact that news travels so fast. Also, character assassination, you know, people make all kinds of ludicrous claims and, and, and prophecies and, and uh, accusations, and you find that by the time that you even finish reading the accusation, the news has already traveled all around the world. And it's very difficult to undo that. It also, social media has definitely reduced the attention span of our young people and including our own. <laughs> our <laughs> own, you know, we, yeah. we also you know, have yeah. become perhaps habituated into looking at things very, very fast. Yeah. But you know, uh, I mean, that technological advancement cannot be stopped. A again, I think that the idea here is that we have to find ways of balancing, not negating a particular technological development, thinking that that negation or, or the fact that we're going to avoid it completely is going to solve our problems. It won't. Uh, we have to simply find a balance in how it can be utilized and used uh, in, a, in a, perhaps in a more optimal manner, you know, in a more balanced manner than before. We still have to encourage our young kids and, and, and ourselves also to read books. To, 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 yeah. to read longer articles and to examine and to talk to people and not simply to, to rely on the, on the uh, virtual interface. You, know, you have to go and meet someone. You have to hug them. You have to shake their hand. You have to look at their eyes and feel their emotions. You know? All of that can't be done on, 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 on the web and, and definitely not through Zoom. You know, for one thing that the experience of me and you sitting here through this interface 
is one thing, but if you and I were here sharing a, a cup of coffee and discussing, I bet you that that conversation would be very, very different. Uh, of, 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 of a deep, uh, and a deep connection could be built. So, but with this particular type of technology, you do get a lot of uh, uh, a, a lack of depth and, and uh, definitely a, la a lack of depth and sophistication. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that affects our understanding. Although we think that we have a lot of facts, what we don't develop is wisdom. Uh, and, and that's, that's, that's what we have to be very, very careful of. A person who's on the net 24 hours is not necessarily wise, wiser. Uh, he has a lot of bits of information. Some of it may, may be true, some of it may not be true. Uh, and of course, their emotions are heightened because everything happens in real time. Uh, you know, a bomb that explodes in Baghdad, suddenly you read it in Malaysia in the next minute, you know, and people go out nowadays and record it with their mobile phones. So, you know, before there was at least some filter, there was some time lag, even there was a time lag for you to kind of absorb all this information and, and make sense of it in your mind. Now there isn't, you know, you have to react to it fast. Your emotions get kind of turned, you know, into it very, very quickly. There's a barrage of information that comes in from all kinds of perspectives. And it's often very, very difficult to find a moment or at least some distance from it all to understand exactly what's going on. So technology will, will develop. You can't stop that particular trend. And that's how it was you know, since, uh, since the world was created. You know, we had the wheel and that led eventually to, to the cart and to the car and to the airplane and to everything else. Uh, and I think that we can't, that there is a propulsion of the human impulse to, to develop and to, to, to generate new technology, which is not going to stop. But we have to find space. We have to find space to read more, to understand people better, less superficially than we do on, 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 on the internet. And I think that the, that's the only way that's going to provide us some depth in an otherwise a situation that perhaps can become very, very superficial. You know? Yeah. Mashallah, the uh, beautiful explanation. Uh, from your travels uh, and various projects around the world, as you mentioned that uh, you've been to UK, US, and uh, now in Jordan, you know, uh, traveling around. Um, also being a founding editor in chief for Islamica magazine, do you think that there is a common thread that binds that binds all of humanity together? If so, how can we promote more of this in this world? I mean, you know, I think existence, you know, we, we're all the same. I mean, yes, we have our different expressions and cultures and, you know, eating habits and so on and, and clothing. But when you, when you live amongst different people, you know, you begin to see that the, the, uh, the issues are virtually the same. You know, they have the same emotions, uh, love, anger, uh, uh, you know, um, issues to do with, with paying their bills and putting their kids to school, uh, getting a job, being able to feed their families, you know, uh, making sure that there's security in their street and the government is doing its job, uh, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, is the healthcare working? Are the schools working, you know? And also longer questions, you know, what happens when I die, you know? Uh, I mean, there's a whole nexus of questions which we all share, you know? Uh, and I think that those are kind of things which, which, um, uh, which touch everyone else, wherever we are. Uh, and so to be able to learn, uh, you know, from them, wherever you are, to be able to appreciate diversity uh, that people bring through their cultures, to be able to appreciate the generosity and courage that many people show wherever they are, whether they're Muslim, Sikh, or, or, or Hindu, or Buddhist, or atheist, or whatever, I think it's part of what we have to, uh, to begin to kind of appreciate in a world that's now you know, so compact because of travel and technology and so on. You know? uh, we, 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 we really are sharing a, one planet, uh, and that means that many of the issues that we also face on, on politics to economy to, to culture is virtually the same. Inshallah, inshallah. Uh, Sidi, as the saying goes, uh, a picture tells a thousand words. You know, photo photograph can be just as valuable as text as a medium of journalistic uh, reporting. 
in your experience as both a photographer and a journalist, what are some of the creative differences in the process of finding and telling a particular story through photos as opposed to text? Well, it's, I mean, in a sense, the, the, the activity is the same. <laughs> that is of, of, of communicating something, you know, whether it is by word uh, or by something visual, like a photo, you know, or even something oral, you know, with music. Uh, you are communicating, communicating something either that's deep uh, about yourself that you wish to convey, or you are trying to capture something that you're observing with your senses. And so, in a way, whether it is photography or, 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 or the uh, written word, uh, it is there a, a, as a form of communication, but the modes of expression do vary. I mean, it's, it's uh, taking a photo requires you to, you know, to, to visually see things. You know, in the case of writing, you, you have to you visually see, uh, you see things in a slightly different mode of, uh, of, uh, uh, of activity. Uh, and you express everything in words. You know, sometimes you, when you see the eye of a child you know, that you try to photograph, that single photo, still photo that is frozen, can, can bring so many words and, and expressions and symbols and meanings to, you, to your mind. You, know, the, you, you can see hope in the child, you can see uh, anger, you can see trauma, you can see many things. And it, it, looking at the picture, all of those emotions can be flooded into your brain, you know, into your apprehension. In the case of writing, you have to express yourself, you have to articulate, you have to define, you have to use words you know, to, to explain exactly that particular emotion, which is why in my, you know, I think that in a way both go together. You know, the, the picture is able to tell something and the writing is also able to tell something. But I think that when they're both conjoined, you know, in uh, uh, where, where text, you know, can perhaps complement the, the visual uh, image, and the image can complement the text. I think you have a very powerful uh, mechanism by which to express and to describe what you see, you know, in the world. Um, but uh, of course, the, the process, you have to learn the camera, how to use it. In the other case of uh, writing, you have to know your grammar, you have to know how to express yourself, you know. Uh, but the creative process, it's, uh, it's quite unique. And with the photography, you have to make sure that you also are uh, humble enough, you know, to, and perhaps, uh, connected enough to the people that you take, you know. I think that the best photographs usually come not when you when you least expect it, but perhaps when your heart is more connected to the uh, subject matter than simply your brain, you know, or your eyes. Uh, I think something special usually happens. You know? Inshallah, beautiful city. Uh, this question that I was I'm about to ask you is a very popular question since a decade ago, uh, because you know online is uh, very strong present and you know it as a, as a as a journalist as a i'll call it publisher right so with advancement in technology right Shidi, many had turned to online channel instead of relying on print media do you think <laughs> that print media is something that will be obsolete now we have kindle and so on amazon doing something what is the role of print media in a world where everyone is going paperless? Everyone is online. Uh, you know, I, I, I love designing and printing books. I, I, I love the smell of books. I, I, the, tactile, <laughs> the tactile experience of yeah. holding the book and yep. feeling the paper. Part of sometimes why you select a certain type of paper is also because of its feel. Uh, you know, you would use a, 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 a coated paper for a magazine and you, you would use a wove paper for a book because the experience of reading and touching things, you know, would be very different. Uh, and, and so it's a whole experience. But I think that as online, you know, digital media develops, uh, a new reading experience will inevitably develop. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's inevitable. And I think that for everyone in the industry, I think we, we know that the days of print, uh, uh, print uh, uh, media are numbered. Uh, it, it would not have its heyday anymore in the 70s or 80s and 90s. You know, it, it has been declined as technology develops. And it's, uh, it's, it's made it more accessible. And of course, save trees and so on. 
but uh, I think that everyone that I know in the industry, uh, including printing presses that are having to shift from their business from offset printing to digital printing, uh, understand that uh, you know the, the industry itself is going to change and change uh, uh, considerably. There are some reports that books are still you know selling well, and occasionally you know there's an increase in trend in some countries, but that's not sustainable. It, it's a uh, sporadic growth. Uh, it's not something that we see happening in a linear manner. Uh, occasionally, you know, as you know, in technology with a mobile phone, the mobile phone started very big and then it became small and then it became big again and it became small again. You know, these kind of fluctuating trends that reappear happen yeah. to be also the same for books. Sometimes when you get tired of reading everything on, on the screen, you, you, you want a book, you know? And so, there will be always books around, but I don't know if the economics of how to sustain it are going to be that much easier. Uh, you know, with the, you know, I know that many publishers have had to fold over the last ten years and close shop because they couldn't make money, they couldn't sustain themselves, the, the sales were declining, and in the case of magazines, it's even, it's even worse. You know, there's been a declining of uh, of. Uh, of sales, but also yeah. because of the decline of sales, there's been a decline of advertising. So no revenue has come in, making it almost impossible for them to uh, uh, to compete. And with, you know, with the cost of fuel also going up and and, and transport costs becoming a nightmare, uh, you find that very few can sustain it. So unless, unless you have uh, uh, philanthropic, you know, kind of entities like WAPs or, or yeah. trusts that yeah. can sustain magazines, most magazines that I know make a loss. Yep. With the exception of the Economist and perhaps one or two of the fashion magazines like Vogue or Tatler, which have a heavy dose of advertising, in the first pages, uh, maybe thirty to forty pages sometimes. Uh, every other magazine that's well known you know, makes a loss, mm -hmm. and those losses are sustained by trusts and by people who care about publishing. But without those, uh, it's impossible to make re revenue anymore. So we are going to see changes. Um, we are already seeing changes. Many of the uh, print, uh, bigger names in print have already shifted, you know, are beginning to shift their, their output to, to the web. Uh, most people don't know how to make money from the web. Uh, so I don't know how <laughs> that will be tackled because even, you know, New York Times or Washington Post or The Guardian or The Times or Telegraph or whatever you have, you know, each one is trying to explore ways of generating income by being online. Uh, and it's not terribly clear to most people in the industry how that can be achieved. So I think we are going to see more and more a, a paperless environment. Uh, people are enjoying reading on their Kindle. People are enjoying reading on their iPads. People are actually enjoying, you know, as screens become better and you know, more defined for mobile phones, they're actually reading books on, on their mobiles. You know? Uh, and text. So, you know, you know, I, when you watch a Tom Cruise film, you know, you see that sometimes, uh, you know, you have screens that would appear with where he would be able to read or check text. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, it's quite foreseeable that in the future, at some point, we would see technology of that kind, and I think that it will affect the print industry, whether what we like it or not. But Shidi, what is the side effect of it that we are, we we are not seeing it, that uh, publication will be obsolete? Is it the intellectual, uh, tradition, knowledge? What are the side effects that we don't foresee? Well, it's difficult to say. I think that, you know, whenever technology or developments have, have happened in human history, there's always been problems, you know? But I think that over time, you know, the human beings have figured out a way to somehow in internalize them uh, and, and find a balance. I don't know if, if, if a balance will be found, you know, for this, uh, particularly given the fact that our attention spans are decreasing and more and more people are able to focus, you know, for, for, you know, for longer periods of time. And I think that's a danger. Uh, how it will affect scholarship? I, th I think it will affect scholarship. You know, if, if, if uh, it, it, uh, you know, maybe not in print, but I think that they have to find ways of publishing their academic outputs online in ways that can be perhaps, you know, uh, uh, you know, where the economics are better for them to be sustainable. Uh, it will affect people's uh, ability to, to digest information. It will affect their concentration span. It will also affect the way perhaps they internalize these ideas. Uh, and I think that 
the loss of the experience of reading, you know, uh, uh, is one I think that that will, will be deeply felt. But you know, I think that we'll overcome those issues. The fact that we are able to access, you know, uh, books a lot more easier now than before uh, is something that perhaps is is is, is a uh, an advantage, you know, to yeah. many of us. You know, you can turn your book into a PDF and still sell it. You know. Uh, and maybe you, you don't, you cannot see it on print, but nevertheless, the fact that you can see it on the screen is still a way to communicate and to keep publishing and still make sure the standards are rigorous. Inshallah. Uh, see, in terms of graphic design, right, we're going, getting back to design and publishing. Different projects uh, can, sorry, different projects often call for different styles and layout. As an award-winning graphic designer, could you share with us your thoughts, process in searching for inspiration, uh, ideation, and execution in your design work? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky question, but <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, every, every single type of book um, has to be done in, 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 in a different way. Uh, I mean, the, the act of reading a fiction book is not the same as reading an academic book. And an academic book is not the same as reading a history book, you know, perhaps, you know, a popular history book. Uh, a ch a children's book, uh, books are not designed the same way as the, the ones for adults. We have to make decisions on fonts, on, on layouts, on, on the many, many, many factors which affect, you know, the design of a particular item. And so, first of all, you do have to know your audience, you know, what, what is it for? Who is it for? You know, how would their reading experience be? And I think that all of those issues are, affect the way you design that particular book. In the same way that you have different activities that require projects for different outputs. Uh, I remember in my youngest days at uh, university when I was told to teach a, a book by Hisham Batalib, uh, it was called the Training Manual for Islamic Workers. I, I, I refused because, uh, you know, uh, to somehow, give template answers you know, for, for how to do things, to me was turning human beings into robots or mm -hmm. ideologues. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's not what we wish to do. We want to make sure that we have critical faculty that can look at the problem and figure out how best to develop something that can be the most effective way of conveying that particular uh, uh, product to others. And you know, in design, there are all kinds of rules. There's the traditional design and those have to be learned if you, if you, if you are going to design. Uh, you have to know, uh, if you're designing books for children, you have to know how to do it and you have to learn the rules and you have to learn the skills and of the craft. Uh, and the same goes for all the other genres. You know, the way you select your type, your, your font, the way you select your paper, the way you, you, you select the size of the book, the way you select the amount of text that should be on the page, the way you select the printing process, all of it affects the way that the book will end up and how it could be effective to particular modes. You know, we have mm -hmm. abysmal, abysmal, abysmal designs in the Arab world for Arabic titles, you know, amongst the Muslim community, you know, uh, because, you know, it, it's almost as if we're not thinking when we, when we design books. Uh, so, you know, we used to have a great tradition of book publishing and binding and so on, but for us, somewhere along the lines in this modern age, uh, I think the Muslim world kind of completely lost the art of producing a good and a handsome and, and an elegant book. Uh, and I think that that tradition needs, to, needs to, to return. So anyone to answer your question, you know, in a short way without waffling too much, is that <laughs> you have to really learn the art of designing books in the old fashioned way uh, and learn all the principles that, uh, that are fundamental to designing any printed page, whatever that happens to be, and make it elegant and effective. Um, so that the written word is enhanced and whatever the author wishes to convey, that's, a, that's made effective even more. Uh, and then you can break your own rules as you master these, you can push the, the, the whole industry forward, but without learning the rules, uh, I don't recommend that anyone designs anything. Siri, sure. sure. uh, what is uh, your, the most meaningful experience in your travel as media specialist? It was in Benghazi in 2011, in about May, just at the beginning of the, of the Libyan revolution, when myself and my colleague and my mentor and my friend and my partner, uh, Dr. Arif Alinayev, uh, we both were in Benghazi at the time. 
uh, and I noticed uh, a huge flurry of, of young people uh, uh, publishing, self-publishing. You know, they were uh, printing magazines, designing, you know, uh, books. Uh, they were writing, you know, for newspapers. Uh, I think that I saw probably 70 magazines uh, in May 2011, you know, that has suddenly come about oh, no. because of the, the revolution, you know, opened a particular, you know, field of, you know, of freedom for certain activities. Uh, and it was just amazing how many young people wanted to express themselves and, and there were some amazing writers there uh, who needed, of course, uh, guidance, mentorship, support. Uh, they needed to, uh, you know, they needed money also to be able to engage in those activities, you know, to support their ventures and, and to receive training. Uh, the saddest part of that was that all of that critical flurry and, and, and amazing energy uh, died, died very quickly, you know, with the growth, with the rise of, of militant and extremist movements in Benghazi, uh, and the, the fact that NGOs did not help, you know, the, uh, in funding these, uh, uh, these young people, uh, and the communities themselves didn't support them, meant that within a very short space of time, those 70 magazines brittled down to about four or five, uh, and it's a shame. It was an utter shame. It, I, mean, I saw it happen in front of me, and, and, and it's, uh, it's one of the, it was one of the most inspiring things and also one of the most depressing things that, uh, you know, that I saw. And I hope that, uh, you know, and along the way, of course, the young person who had so much energy lost hope in being able to contribute to, to the field of publishing and journalism and communication. And I think that was a, a sad development for the game. Uh, I saw that uh, the burning of Libya, very sad to see it's, it's happening. Yeah, may Allah ease them. Uh, were there any issues uh, in the world that shocked you in your work in publishing? Yeah, I mean, the two things still shock me. You know, every time I read or interview someone or, or come across, you know, people from in, in, in particular politics. And one is the issue of human trafficking. Uh, oh. it's so serious, it's so serious. You know, from child abductions that happen in China to, to uh, refugees, you know, being uh, pushed into human trafficking, to sex trade and, and, and children being uprooted from their mothers and fathers and, and thrown into a life of crime, you know. I, I mean, the whole, you know, I, I remember, remember at Islamic they're having to do a feature issue uh, a feature kind of article on that issue, and it was uh, horrendous. I mean, it was absolutely horrendous. Uh, what women, and particularly children and, and men, of course, had to go through uh, as victims of, of human trafficking around the world. And the, and the industry that, that perpetuates this is colossal. They're linked to mafias, they're linked to all kinds of enablers uh, that, uh, that make money out of tragedy, of human tragedy. And I think I still find it very, very difficult to, to hear and to, and to, to uh, you know, to, to kind of take in this information, particularly when you have families that, whose children were kidnapped, you know, and, and suddenly, you know, for all they know, they are in, 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 as victims of the human trafficking in kind of a, you know, mafia, you know, you know uh, uh, industry. The second one was uh, abuse in prisons. You know? I think that, that that's something that happens around the world. And we keep hearing it, some of the, uh, some of the abuse that we, we hear and, uh, and, and see narrated is so, it's so disgraceful and disgusting and, and painful even to listen to. So, and it keeps happening even, it does, does not matter how many human rights conventions we have, you know, abuse still happens, you know, human beings, hurt other human beings in, 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 uh, in very immoral, you know, kind of dehumanized ways. Um, and everyone's, every country's guilty of it. Coming to from that uh, issues of human trafficking and abuse in prison, right, CD, uh, when you face issues that are culturally or socially sensitive, right, how do you prepare yourself for it? It depends. I mean, I, you know, I, I went to study uh, in, in, at the Vatican. I went to Rome to study Catholic theology because I was involved in, in interfaith relations. And I didn't want it to become a, a Zakirnaic type of, you know, bashing. You know, I, I, I hate that type, type of approach because if I don't like uh, 
evangelicals or everyone else bashing Muslims in the same way by, by reducing their religion to nothing, I equally should not like a Muslim doing the same for other religions. So I wanted to study. I, wanted, I went there. I, 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 I wanted to listen. I wanted to study to understand how is it that they think, how do Catholics feel. Uh, uh, I, I learned their history, their theology, their, you know, their, 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 you know, their issues. Uh, and I did the same thing for Protestant theology. And that informed my work in Christian Muslim relations. I think made it more effective, I think. Uh, and the same happens you know, with other issues that are of a sensitive nature. You have to study, uh, you have to do your due diligence. You have to put your views to the side for a second you know, and do your, your due diligence of research. You have to talk to people who are belong to that particular, you know, whatever issue that's being affected that you are covering. And then you also have to, and you have to bring some humility in, in, into, into your analysis. Uh, and of course, if, if you are dealing with really difficult, you know, uh, issues of an emotional kind, you do have to pray for guidance. You know, you have to <laughs> ask God also mm -hmm. to make some of the discernments of these issues easier for you to grasp. Because when we are faced with, uh, with, with data, uh, whether it is data, you know, that is of a human kind or whether it is simply factual of economics and numbers and, and, and or politics and developments, uh, uh, all of it requires absorption and all of it requires you to structure that, you know, that data into some kind of conclusion or some kind of observations that you want to be right. You know, you want to make sure that you don't, you know, exacerbate misunderstanding because so much now is written, particularly about Muslims or the Middle East or Libya, you know, that has no basis on reality. And, and it's either all of it simply a, a biased kind of, you know, vindictiveness, you know, or it is emanating out of sheer ignorance. Uh, and we have to make sure that we don't fall into the same trap, you know. So humility is required. And, and of course, the ability to ask a lot of questions and very important questions and chase that story, whatever it takes. A lot of interesting, Sidi. Uh, we have been talking almost uh, one and a half hours, Sidi, mashallah. There's so much to learn from you and so many questions that I'd like to ask, but I think due to time constraint, uh, this is our last question. And I uh, hope to learn more from you soon, inshallah. The last question is, what were some of the most difficult interviews or story that you had to cover for you personally or for any publishing or publication, sorry? How do you deal with it? Yeah. Well, I think for us, at least is Islamic, there are two things. One, one the Islamic area, uh, era was when we had to cover the Iraq war. Uh, that was difficult. You know, we, we sent some of our reporters to Iraq, you know, uh, several times we lost, we lost touch with them. You know, the war was happening. Uh, uh, one or two of them were arrested by militias and then released. Uh, and uh, to get stories out of Iraq at the time was very hard. And particularly when there was a lot of destruction of, of uh, religious sites, but also of human you know, a lot of deaths, a lot of assassinations, you know, uh, by competing forces. And I think that yeah. that to me, I, because I was living in Jordan at the time, so, you know, literally very near, you know, in, in the geographic area, the issue, the whole issue was very immediate for us. Uh, and uh, it was difficult. It was the responsibility of having to send reporters there and then making sure they're safe and, uh, uh, you know, and they avoiding the missile or the bomb or, or the bullet. Uh, but at the same time, being able to write about what they see and, and convey the stories back and have them published uh, was, was difficult, but it's also, it, it was exactly what we were, the magazine was all about. Uh, later on, of course, to me personally, for the last 10 years, it's been the Libyan revolution to be, you know, to, you know, to be, to have been part of it, to see it firsthand, how a whole revolution was stolen by, by Islamists and by radicals and so on. And how, you know, for the last 10 years, a revolution that took so little time to, to kind of get going, uh, a whole nation has been completely torn apart by, by vested interests. You know, for me, that was uh, the most painful uh, experience so far. And I hope that, you know, Libya comes out of it, you know, victorious. Inshallah, I mean, thank you, Sidi. Uh, we, we had a wonderful and blessed time with you listening to your you. uh, experience. And uh, mashallah. We, I wish we can continue more, but alhamdulillah, time constraint. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, thank with you us. Very much. May Allah preserve you, and uh, may we continue to benefit from the works that you are doing. 
And each time we look at your book, inshallah, we always are inspired to to do to do good and to do well, and inshallah. Well, I have I have a, I have a book coming out soon, and that's called uh, a, a Portrait of Libya, and it uh, uh, features three cities: Benghazi, uh, uh, Tripoli, and Bani Wali. And it's uh, it, it, there's no politics involved there, but these pictures I've taken over ten years uh, of this of the country, of its people, architecture, and and, uh, uh, and so on. You know what makes it very very beautiful, and I, and that's one way to to appreciate perhaps you know what Libya has to offer, you know, to it, its own future generations and, and to the world. Now, I'm, we are looking forward to it, inshallah. I'm sure it will be and available at Warda. Soon. Very soon. <laughs> yeah, maybe, so. maybe not in print edition, maybe in, in, uh, in digital format. Oh, okay. If then, then also we are looking forward to it. Siri. Thank you very much once again. May Allah preserve you. Keep in touch again and uh, looking forward to work with you again soon. Inshallah. May Thank Allah you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much to you guys. Bye-bye. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam.